911. I need an ambulance. What's wrong, ma'am? My daughter fell in the pole and she's not breathing. Where at, ma'am? Uh, in Esso. Ma'am, what's your address? 3343 1st Avenue South. 3343 1st Avenue South. She's seven years old. All right, hang on just a second, ma'am. Do you have a fault, ma'am? No, she's not got nothing. She is purple. The 911 call was initially made by his daughter, and what appeared to be a tragic accident quickly morphed into a perplexing mystery. As details of that fateful afternoon slowly surfaced, the case unravelled a disturbing set of circumstances, so bizarre that it left everyone who heard about it shocked. The unsettling event left behind more questions than answers, and even today, doubts persist about the true nature of the incident. Was it a terrible accident, or was there something far more sinister at play? We invite you to immerse yourself in this chilling story. Don't miss any detail as we walk through the unsettling events surrounding the case of Adriana and Lane Giotto. Before we dive into today's case, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to the channel and leave a like on this video so I can continue bringing you the best content in criminalistics. Let's get started. Adriana Giotto was born on September 16, 1999, in Alabama, United States. She entered the world in the context of a complicated and unstable family environment. By the time Adriana was just six months old, her mother, Amanda Lewis, was serving in the army, and due to her military commitments, she left Adriana in the care of her maternal grandmother, Brenda Burns. Little is known about Amanda's experience in the military or why she eventually left the armed forces, but it is clear that soon after Adriana's birth, Amanda became pregnant again. After nine months of pregnancy, she gave birth to her second child, a boy she named Andrew Jordan Giotto. However, most people who knew him simply referred to him as AJ. There are two conflicting versions of who fathered Adriana and AJ. According to one account, both children had the same father, a man who was in a steady relationship with Amanda. The other version, however, suggests that Adriana and AJ had different fathers, despite sharing the same last name. Regardless of the specifics, Adriana was a bright and cheerful child with an infectious smile. She was outgoing, energetic and full of life, but at times her exuberance could be overwhelming for her mother. Amanda often described Adriana as someone who constantly sought attention and was quite stubborn. The relationship between mother and daughter was difficult, a situation that was exacerbated when Adriana was diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. As a young mother, Amanda struggled with the demands of raising a child with ADHD, and for a time she felt disconnected from her daughter. However, as Adriana grew older, Amanda claimed that the love she felt for her daughter allowed her to adapt to Adriana's energetic personality, and their bond strengthened over time. AJ, in contrast, was much more reserved and calm. He could sit alone for hours, content to play with his toys or watch cartoons on television. By 2007, the family had settled in Esto, Florida, a modest town located in the northern part of the state, near the border with Alabama. Esto was a quiet community, with a population of just 361 at the time. Amanda was working as a nursing assistant at a local care home, and according to some reports, she had a new partner, Alan Carling, who had two children of his own, Michael and Amber Carling. However, there is little reliable information about Alan and his children, and it remains unclear whether they all lived together. On August 8, 2007, the town of Esto was hit by a particularly hot day, and Adriana, who was seven years old at the time, along with her six-year-old brother, AJ, wanted to cool off in their small plastic backyard pool. The pool was just 1.2 metres deep, but access was restricted because the pool ladder was locked in a shed, preventing the children from getting in without adult supervision. Amanda, however, had already made plans to take the children out to buy school supplies, so she did not allow them to swim in the pool. Instead, 
she permitted them to play in the backyard while she prepared for the outing. Not long after the children went outside, A.J. shouted to his mother that Adriana was playing dangerously close to the pool. A few moments later, Amanda looked out the window and saw A.J. standing at the edge of the pool with his hand in the water. Alarmed, she rushed outside to find her daughter floating face down in the water, unconscious. Without hesitation, Amanda pulled Adriana from the pool and immediately noticed that her daughter's face and lips had turned purple, a clear sign of oxygen deprivation. Water was also trickling from Adriana's nose, and Amanda realised that her daughter had likely been submerged for some time. She began performing CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in a desperate attempt to revive Adriana, but despite her best efforts, Adriana showed no signs of recovery. Panicked, Amanda dialed 911 to request emergency assistance. Within minutes, several emergency response teams arrived on the scene, including firefighters and paramedics. The first responders noticed dirt near the pool, suggesting that there had been a struggle or that Adriana had slipped before falling into the water. The medical team quickly took over CPR efforts and after several attempts, Adriana's pulse was faintly restored. She was immediately airlifted by helicopter to the nearest hospital. The emergency doctor and a team of medical staff worked tirelessly for over an hour in a bid to save Adriana's life. But tragically, despite their efforts, the little girl was pronounced dead at 5.05 p.m. When the doctor informed Amanda that her daughter had passed away, her reaction was surprisingly restrained. According to some media reports, she appeared cold and instead of grieving, immediately asked where the nearest vending machine was. However, other reports state that she approached her daughter's body, kissed and hugged her, knowing it would be the last time she could hold her. Due to the tragic nature of the incident and the fact that Adriana was a minor, the authorities launched an investigation to determine the cause of the accident. Amanda was questioned by the police, and in her initial statements, she explained that she had worked the night shift and had taken a nap while her children watched cartoons. She later allowed them to play in the backyard, where Adriana was cleaning bugs from the pool. Amanda claimed that Adriana accidentally slipped, likely hitting her head and losing consciousness. According to her story, her son, AJ, tried to help his sister but was unable to, and he screamed for his mother's help. The initial autopsy concluded that Adriana's death was accidental, caused by drowning. Both the Sheriff's Department and the criminal investigators had no reason to suspect foul play, and the case was closed. However, within an hour of closing the case, chilling new statements emerged. While doctors were still trying to save Adriana, A.J., under the care of his grandparents, told them that his mother had drowned his sister by holding her face and pushing her under the water. Shocked by this revelation, Amanda's mother, Brenda, and her stepfather, Charles Burns, took A.J. to the police department to repeat his story. That same day, A.J. was interviewed twice by investigators and a child expert. His stories, though mixing fantasy and reality, were consistent in describing how his mother had punished Adriana by holding her underwater. A.J. recounted that Adriana had sprayed cleaning fluid on the television earlier, which had infuriated Amanda. In a fit of rage, she grabbed Adriana and placed her in the pool. Despite Adriana's fear of water, Amanda held her face and submerged her. A.J. even demonstrated how his mother pressed her hand on Adriana's forehead and cheek. Given A.J.'s testimony, the police reopened the case and launched a more thorough investigation. Amanda was interviewed three more times by officials, and although she consistently denied the accusations, she agreed to take a polygraph test, which she passed. Nevertheless, her answers failed to completely convince the authorities. Investigators began verifying A.J.'s version of events. The boy had mentioned specific TV shows they watched that morning. 
workers cutting trees outside, and army helicopters flying over the house. All of these details were verified as accurate, confirming that AJ had a clear recollection of the day's events. One of the most significant discoveries was the condition of the family home. When police entered the house with a warrant, they found it in disarray. The children's beds had no sheets, and their bedroom smelled strongly of urine, a result of Adriana's bedwetting, a symptom of her disorder. What was particularly odd was the complete lack of toys in the house, apart from a pool and a small red car in the yard. Amanda claimed she had confiscated the children's toys as punishment, but when the garage was searched, no toys were found. This inconsistency raised further suspicions. Investigators also spoke with the doctor who had treated Adriana in the emergency room. The doctor noted Amanda's lack of emotion when informed of her daughter's death, a reaction that struck her as unusual. As the investigation unfolded, more disturbing information came to light. Adriana was not Amanda's first child. As a teenager, Amanda had given birth to a boy named Alex, who tragically died at just 16 months old. Amanda had claimed that Alex had suffered a seizure after falling from a bed. The circumstances surrounding his death now raised additional questions about Amanda's parenting and her role in Adriana's drowning. The case left the community divided. Some could not believe that a 27-year-old mother would harm her child, while others were horrified by the idea of such an innocent life being taken. Despite the rumours swirling, Amanda was arrested in September 2007 and charged with first-degree murder. The prosecution offered her a plea deal for involuntary manslaughter, which would have resulted in a 10-year sentence. Amanda rejected the deal, and five months later, she faced trial. AJ, now seven, was the prosecution's key witness. The defense argued that AJ's changing story made him unreliable, but the court allowed his testimony. AJ's account remained consistent in one critical detail. He saw his mother drown his sister. During the trial, the autopsy reports were key. They revealed multiple bruises on Adriana's body, consistent with AJ's account of the events. Post-mortem photos also showed hand-shaped marks on Adriana's face, which matched AJ's description of how his mother held her down. The emergency room doctor confirmed these findings, further supporting AJ's testimony. In a highly emotional moment during the trial, AJ brought a drawing to court and explained in detail what he had seen. When the judge pointed out his mother's presence in the courtroom, AJ broke down in tears. Amanda also cried, pleading with her son to stop saying those things. Despite the heart-wrenching scene, AJ stood by his story. After four days of trial and just two hours of deliberation, the jury found Amanda guilty of first-degree murder and aggravated child abuse. A month later, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The sentencing brought closure to the legal process, but the aftermath left lingering questions and a community still deeply divided. Some people, particularly those close to Amanda, continued to believe in her innocence, insisting that the prosecution had wrongfully relied on the inconsistent testimony of a child. Supporters of Amanda argued that AJ's young age and the emotional trauma of witnessing his sister's death made him an unreliable witness. They pointed to the fact that AJ's story had changed multiple times suggesting that his imagination and confusion could have distorted the events of that tragic day. On the other hand, many believed that justice had been served, convinced that the physical evidence, including the bruises and hand marks found on Adriana's body, aligned too closely with AJ's account to be dismissed as coincidence. Despite the conviction, Amanda maintained her innocence. In 2010, her legal team filed an appeal citing various reasons for overturning the verdict. One of the central arguments in the appeal was the doctrine of merger, which posits that the aggravated child abuse charge should have been excluded, as it was the basis 
for the felony murder charge. The defence also called into question the credibility of the forensic evidence and witnesses, particularly the doctor who performed the autopsy. The doctor had been removed from his position due to negligence in other cases, and this cast doubt on the validity of the findings in Adriana's case. However, the appeal failed, and Amanda's life sentence was upheld by the court. Even in prison, Amanda continued to speak out, maintaining her innocence in multiple interviews. She spoke of her love for her children and claimed that the justice system had failed her, painting her as a villain based on circumstantial evidence and the unreliable testimony of a young child. However, these interviews did little to sway public opinion, which remained split between those who believed she was a wrongfully convicted mother and those who saw her as the perpetrator of an unforgivable crime. For AJ, the emotional toll was immense. After the trial, he was adopted by a new family and given the chance to lead a normal life, free from the trauma of his past. Yet, despite his new circumstances, the memory of what he witnessed never left him. The experience shaped his ability to connect with others, particularly his biological mother. While Amanda had tried to reach out to AJ, hoping to reconnect, his emotional scars made it difficult for him to fully engage with her, leaving their relationship fractured. Psychologists and experts who analysed AJ's behaviour expressed concern about the long-term impact of witnessing such a traumatic event at such a young age. They pointed out that while AJ's testimony had been key to convicting his mother, the stress and emotional weight of testifying against her could have lasting effects on his mental health. For AJ, the burden of carrying that truth was a heavy one, and some questioned whether the child would ever fully recover from the emotional scars of the tragedy. The community, too, struggled to come to terms with the case. Some believed that justice had been served, while others continued to express doubt, especially in light of the questions raised during the appeal process. Over time, the case faded from the headlines, but for those directly involved, the pain and uncertainty lingered. Adriana's death was a tragic reminder of the fragility of life and the deep emotional scars that can be left behind when justice is not clear-cut. In the years that followed, AJ's case was studied by legal scholars and child psychology experts. It became a focal point for discussions about the reliability of child witnesses and the complexities of cases involving young children as key testimonies. Some argued that more should have been done to ensure that AJ's mental health was safeguarded during the investigation and trial process, as well as in the aftermath. Others contended that his testimony was crucial in revealing the truth and bringing justice to Adriana. Amanda, now serving a life sentence, continued to file appeals and fight for a reconsideration of her case. But with each legal battle, her chances of overturning the conviction seemed slim. As the years passed, Amanda remained a controversial figure, some viewing her as a wronged mother, others as a calculating killer. Her fate appeared sealed, and though she never stopped proclaiming her innocence, the weight of evidence against her kept her behind bars. Meanwhile, for AJ, his new life provided a sense of stability that had been missing during his turbulent childhood. Though the memories of what he had seen haunted him, he found solace in the love and care of his new family. With time, he was able to focus on his future, slowly building a life away from the shadows of his past. Ultimately, the case of Adriana's death serves as a reminder of the complexities involved in justice, memory and trauma. It demonstrates how difficult it can be to discern truth in the face of conflicting evidence and emotional testimonies, especially when a young child's future hangs in the balance. For all involved, the case left a lasting imprint, a tragic legacy that still sparks debate about the thin line between guilt and innocence, and the heavy toll that justice can take on a family and a community.
On Christmas night in 1996, a murder shocked the world. A six-year-old girl was found dead in the basement of her home. For over a quarter of a century, despite the involvement of several hundred people, including her parents and brother, the mystery remains unsolved. Many believe the killer has been known for years. John Benet Patricia Ramsey was born on August 6, 1990, into a wealthy family that seemed to have everything. Her father, John Bennett Ramsey, was the president of a computer sales company. The family moved to Boulder, Colorado, where they purchased a large home. From an early age, John Benet participated in beauty pageants, winning numerous titles, which brought her fame and became an additional source of income for her parents. On December 25, 1996, Jean Benet and her parents celebrated Christmas with friends. The evening was filled with joy and the children were entertained by Santa Claus. On the way home, Jean Benet fell asleep in the car and her father carried her to bed. This was the last time her parents saw her alive. What followed shocked the quiet, respectable town and turned it into the epicenter of one of the most mysterious murders in history. On December 26th, John Benet's mother woke up at 5 a.m. to prepare for a family trip to Lake Michigan. As she descended the stairs, she found a ransom note on the last step. The note claimed that John Benet had been kidnapped and demanded $118,000 for her return, the exact amount of John Ramsey's annual bonus. Patricia immediately ran to John Benet's room, but her daughter was gone. She woke her husband, and despite the kidnapper's warning not to involve the police, the couple called law enforcement. Patricia also reached out to friends for support, and many came to the house. The ransom note stated that the kidnappers would contact them within a few hours, but no call came. The note, which became a key piece of evidence, was passed from hand to hand. The police failed to secure the scene properly, and they didn't even search the house. Instead, they asked the family to check if anything was missing. It wasn't until seven hours later that John Ramsey went to the basement and discovered John Bonet's body. She had two large head injuries, bloodstains on her underwear, and her hands were bound above her head with a white string. What began as a kidnapping quickly turned into a murder investigation. Questions arose about the ransom note. It had been written on paper from the Ramsey's home, leading police to suspect that the killer had written it while the family slept. No one had heard anything suspicious during the night. How did the killer manage to move Jean Benet from her bedroom to the basement without leaving any traces or waking anyone? The investigation was plagued by mistakes. The house wasn't thoroughly searched, and when it was, John Ramsey and a family friend conducted the inspection, not the police. This mishandling may have cost investigators valuable evidence. Two main theories emerged, an intruder had entered the house. Either a stranger or someone the family knew, or the parents were involved. When John and Patricia learned they were under suspicion, they hired top lawyers and refused to give written statements. The investigation had hoped to analyze their testimony for inconsistencies. The couple's refusal only fueled suspicion. There were also inconsistencies in the parents' account of the events. Patricia claimed she had undressed John Benet and let her hair down before bed, but the girl was found in her clothes with her hair in two ponytails. Laurel wreath fragments, part of the girl's holiday attire, were found in her hair. Additionally, undigested pineapple was discovered in Jean Bonnet's stomach during the autopsy, suggesting she had eaten about four hours before her death. However, her parents said the last time she ate was at the Christmas celebration. A bowl of pineapple was found in the family's refrigerator, deepening investigators' suspicions. Moreover, some windows and doors in the house were unlocked that night. Why hadn't the Ramses secured their home? Investigators speculated that the locks were tampered with after the murder to mislead them. Lastly, Patricia underwent a handwriting analysis to compare her writing to the ransom note. Investigators believed she altered her handwriting during the test, raising more questions about her involvement. Later, it was determined that the note had been written using a typewriter. To this day, the John Bonet Ramsey case remains unsolved, haunting both the public and investigators. A chilling theory suggests that her father, John Ramsey, could have accidentally killed his daughter in a fit of anger. 
police speculated that he might have staged the entire scene, writing a ransom note to cover up the crime. Despite being under suspicion, John Bonet's parents, John and Patsy Ramsey, appeared on TV shows, gave numerous interviews, and even published a book titled in which they claimed to reveal all they knew about the murder. Investigators, however, believed there was more to the story, and one detective, Steve Thomas, also wrote a book about the case, raising further questions about the truth behind John Benet's tragic death. While the Ramses struggled to clear their names, some believed that the family continued to profit from the tragedy. In fact, they even won a $4 million lawsuit against two publications that had accused them of being involved in their daughter's murder. Many viewed this legal victory as just another way the family seemed to benefit from Jean Benet's death, fueling suspicions of their involvement. Meanwhile, the investigation continued to explore another theory, that Jean Benet's participation in beauty pageants may have made her a target. Due to her high visibility in the public eye, it's plausible that someone could have become obsessed with her, found out where she lived and killed her. However, this theory proved difficult to pursue because the potential list of suspects was enormous. Thousands of people had seen Jean Benet perform, but none stood out as credible suspects, and the investigation hit a dead end. As time passed, hopes for solving the case dwindled, especially after Patsy Ramsey passed away from ovarian cancer on June 24, 2006. The case, however, took an unexpected turn just two months later when a man named John Mark Carr made a shocking confession claiming responsibility for John Bonet's murder. Carr's confession captivated the public and gave investigators hope that the case would finally be solved. He claimed to have seen Jean Bonnet at one of her beauty pageants and that he became infatuated with her. According to him, he gathered photos and newspaper clippings about the young girl and even fantasised about writing a book about her murder. At first, the police were hopeful that the case had finally been solved. However, as they dug deeper into Carr's confession, it quickly became apparent that he was not the real killer. Carr couldn't provide crucial details about the crime. He was confused about important facts, such as how John Bonet's home looked or the events of that night. Some psychologists theorised that Carr confessed out of a pathological need for attention, a phenomenon not unheard of in high-profile cases like this. Others believed that Carr had become so deeply obsessed with John Bonet's case that he had blurred the line between reality and fantasy. In his mind, he may have truly believed he was responsible for her death. But despite Carr's elaborate confession, investigators found no evidence linking him to the crime. In 2008, there was a significant breakthrough in the case when DNA analysis revealed that the blood found on John Benet's underwear did not belong to any of her family members. Instead, it belonged to an unidentified male. This discovery appeared to be a critical lead. But after checking the DNA against the FBI's extensive database, the investigation hit another roadblock. No match was found. The case remained cold until 2016, when Jean Bonnet's older brother, Burke Ramsey, gave his first public interview. In his interview, Burke shared his belief that Jean Bonnet's murder was likely the result of a deranged criminal who had become obsessed with her. He suggested that someone had noticed her at one of her beauty contests and had decided to commit the crime. Burke's interview added fuel to an already controversial theory that he himself may have been responsible for his sister's death. This theory posits that Burke, who was nine years old at the time, accidentally or deliberately caused John Bonet's fatal injuries. Supporters of this theory believe that Burke may have struck his sister, either during a sibling quarrel or out of jealousy over the attention she received from their parents. Jean Bonnet's success in beauty pageants could have increased the resentment Burke felt, which may have boiled over on the night of her death. Critics of this theory argue that a nine-year-old child would not be capable of inflicting the severe injuries that caused Jean Bonnet's death. However, if Burke had indeed harmed his sister, it is conceivable that his parents could have helped cover up the crime. If John and Patsy Ramsey had already lost one child, it's plausible they would go to great lengths to protect Burke from the stigma of being labelled a murderer, even if it meant concealing the truth from investigators. 
Although the theory of Burke's involvement is often criticised, some elements make it hard to dismiss. For instance, John Bonnet's skull fracture was the result of a significant impact, which could have been caused by a heavy object. Some theorists suggest that Burke may have accidentally hit her with a flashlight or that a sibling quarrel got out of hand. If Burke did harm his sister, it's likely that his parents, desperate to protect their only surviving child, would have staged the kidnapping and written the ransom note in an attempt to cover up the truth. In 2019, another unexpected development occurred when 50-year-old inmate Gary Oliva confessed to John Bonnet's murder. Oliva was already serving a sentence for crimes involving children, and his confession drew immediate attention. Interestingly, Oliva had been a suspect early in the investigation. Shortly after John Benet's murder, police had searched his vehicle and found a stun gun, along with disturbing poems he had written about John Benet. On the night of the murder, Oliva had even made a phone call to a friend, Michael Vale, saying, I hurt a little girl. Vale later informed the police about the call, but nothing substantial came of it. Then, in 2016, Vale received letters from Oliva in prison, in which Oliva confessed to killing John Bonnet. He described himself as a serial killer and claimed to have a mental disorder that made him unable to control his actions. Despite these disturbing confessions, the police were unable to find any definitive evidence linking Oliva to John Bonnet's death. Oliva's confession raised further questions. For one, he claimed John Bonnet's death was accidental, stating she had tripped and hit her head. However, forensic evidence indicated that her skull fracture was the result of a blow from a heavy object, not a fall. Additionally, investigators found no signs of forced entry into the Ramsey home. Oliva's story also didn't account for how he would have been able to carry out the crime without waking any of the family members or leaving any physical evidence behind. One critical piece of evidence that further weakened Oliva's confession was the basement window which police initially believed the intruder used to enter the house. However, the window was covered in a thick layer of cobwebs, suggesting that no one had passed through it in quite some time. This led many to believe that an intruder theory, whether involving Oliver or someone else, was highly unlikely. The case of John Benet Ramsey remains one of the most perplexing and controversial murder cases in modern history. With so many conflicting theories and so little solid evidence, it's no surprise that this case continues to capture the public's attention. Whether the killer was an outsider, a family member, or someone else entirely, we may never know. But with each new development, it becomes clear that the truth may forever remain just out of reach. Of all the theories, the one suggesting Burke's involvement seems to align most with the available evidence. The idea that an intruder entered the home, committed the murder, and left without leaving any trace seems improbable. In contrast, if Burke was responsible, his parents' involvement in staging a kidnapping to protect him makes sense. If Burke had unintentionally killed his sister, his parents likely would have done anything to avoid losing their only remaining child. The biggest question that remains is whether John Bonnet's death was the result of a tragic accident or a deliberate act. If Burke had struck his sister in a moment of anger or jealousy, it could have easily led to her death. The Ramsey's decision to cover up the crime may have been driven by their fear of losing their son to the legal system and the stigma that would follow. In conclusion, while many continue to debate the facts and speculate about what happened that fateful night, the truth remains elusive. It's possible that we will never know who truly killed John Benet Ramsey. What do you think happened? Share your thoughts and theories in the comments and don't forget to like this video to help spread the word about one of the most mysterious murder cases in history.